What are the signs of the times? Two kingdoms are at war. We are in a clash of dynasties. The headlines today seem to indicate that evil forces and the power of darkness are prevailing in the last days against the kingdom of light. The signs are wars and rumors of wars, natural disasters and man-made calamities. Will we be the generation to witness his coming, to witness both a great awakening and a falling away from the faith? How do we fight for the kingdom of light? How do we know how it ends? Let's look at the headlines. I've joked with him over the last several months, but watch this next weekend when you see him lead. He smiles all the time. And it's not just that he's having fun, it's that he means it. And so it's a privilege to have him leading us on Sunday morning. So Pastor Joel, we just say thank you again, brother. Prior to my arrival here in Northeast Ohio six months ago, when I joined the team here at Grace, I had both the profound honor and the magnificent responsibility of being the lead pastor of a quiet little church nestled within a resort community set at an altitude of 8,000 feet atop the scenic San Bernardino Mountains of Southern California. And this resort community was best known for its two ski areas, its big lake for summer activities, its rare seasonal change for Southern California, and all of that surrounded by a majestic forest of 150 to 200 foot pine trees. And because of its, uh, both its easy accessibility as well as its unique mountain charm, for decades that community has also often served as a filming location for quite a few movies and TV shows. Some of real historic significance like Gone with the Wind. The Andy Griffith Show. There you go. Who would have thought that Mayberry was actually in Southern California? In more recent years, it has been a, an extremely popular location for a number of Hallmark movies. In fact, on one particular Easter Sunday, because I like some Hallmark movies, I looked out into the crowd and saw an entire cast, a well-known cast from one of those movies. Here's a picture of the church that I had the privilege of leading. In fact, if you happen to watch any Hallmark Christmas movies, you may in fact see this little church in a couple of them. And because of its iconic look and its picturesque location, during my season as pastor there, we, we had a small handful of requests to use our church as a movie set. And any time a request like that would come in, I would always ask if I could see the script because I wanted to know how they were planning on depicting churches and Christianity in that movie. I just didn't want our little church to be the visual image of any negative depictions of any church anywhere. Now, I'm sure it won't surprise you to know that in all of the requests that came in, in my time as pastor there, almost 10 years, we only said yes one time. And so that one time we said yes, on the first day of that movie shoot, I get to the campus early to open everything up for the production crew, and about an hour into that process, I'm standing right at the entrance to that little church, and before I knew it, I was at the center of a casual conversation with a decent-sized group of cast and crew and movie extras, and of course, at first, we just talked about all the basic stuff, like who are you, what's your name, where are you from, all over Southern California, some all over the country, and, and so we're having the casual conversation for about a half hour, and so after, after a little while, one person in the group then finally says, so you're the pastor of this church, right? To which I said, yes. <laughs> and then she said, so then do you believe that only people who go to church will get into heaven? <laughs> to which I then said, before I give my answer, I am curious about what all of you believe. And so began about an hour-long conversation where a couple dozen people began to share their thoughts and ideas and opinions about heaven. And as you can imagine, those thoughts and opinions and ideas were all over the map. But eventually, that conversation makes its way all the way around the group to, this, to a gentleman on my right who said, you know, I really don't think that any of us are really in a position to say who does or does not get into heaven. 
And he says, as an elder of my church, I feel strongly that living a good life and being a good person is what we should all be focused on, to which most of the crowd voiced their immediate agreement. Now, he wasn't from some relig uh, fringe religion or anything like that. He was actually an elder at a Presbyterian church. And that's not a commentary on Presbyterians. That's just a statement of fact about the man and this conversation. And sure enough, after he said that, the woman who posed the original question then looked at me and said, do you agree with him? And all of a sudden, in an instant, just like that, there I was, put on the spot, and all eyes were on me. You want to know what I said? I'll tell you a little later in the message. I'm going to tell you how I responded a little later in the message. You're going to have to stay with me this morning if you want to know how I responded. But I'm going to tell you this. It's probably not as predictable as you might think. How's that for a little suspense and drama to start us off this morning? Anyway, I, I, there I was. I had just gone to the campus to open it up for a movie set. And before I knew it, a full-blown conversation broke out with a few dozen people about, of all things, heaven. And I shared that story with you for two reasons this morning. One, because that's what we're going to be talking about today, too. Today, we're going to be talking about heaven. And number two, I shared that really quick story as a revelation of sorts that people have all kinds of self-conceived notions of what heaven is and about who and how people get in. Friends, today we are continuing in our current sermon series simply called Headlines, and we've been covering a number of topics connected to biblical prophecy, but also how, in various ways, the headlines back in Jesus' day not only pointed to, but have actually written some of the headlines for today. And again, over the past couple weeks, Pastor Roy has covered the topics of the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ, uh, the, the great tribulation, and next week he'll talk about the millennial reign of Christ and the great white throne and so on. And today, packaged right in the middle of all of that is our topic of heaven. Now, before I jump into that a little bit deeper, I need to make a couple of really quick disclaimers for you today. The first disclaimer I want to make for you is this, that I want to let you know it's a confession moment. I need to let you know that earlier this week, uh, it was last, last, two, or last Monday, I pulled Pastor Roy aside and I let him know that I'm really agitated with him. I let him know. I said, Pastor Roy, you need to know that I'm upset with you. You've been getting on my nerves the last couple of weeks. You've really been bothering me. And he looks at me kind of like, what now? You know? He always does. He knows he talks. He backs off like that. It's just kind of a, it's my Roy-ism. I know he's watching online, so what now? You know, I'm just... <laughs> I said, Pastor Roy, I got a bone to pick with you. I'm agitated because, honestly, that man has done such a profoundly masterful job of simplifying these incredibly deep topics uh, on prophecy. And I'm like, Pastor Roy, how in the world am I supposed to contend with that? I told him, I said, I don't even want to preach in this series. You know, the, the, the truth is everybody in the world can look at a good plate of food and know that it's a good plate of food. But only a small handful of people can look at that plate of food and know all of the hard work that went into preparing it, Right? Well, I've sat here for the last couple weeks, and I've enjoyed the good plate of food, but if I, I, of all people, understand how much work and effort went into those messages. And I feel like Pastor Roy has set such a high bar for this series. It's like he's come out here week after week offering everybody four-course meals, and now here I am today bringing a Happy Meal <laughs> without the toy. So I told him, I don't want to preach in this series. I'm not trying to keep up with that. And then last week of all weeks, he manages to bring in the theme song for Smoking the Bandit. He's bounding down, rolling on a truck. Like, really? And then he drops Leonard Skinner in a minute. Like, he's showing off now. He's showing off. Good Lord. Well, I know Pastor Roy is watching this morning online, and all I got to say is this. Pastor Roy, game on, my friend. Gauntlet thrown, challenge accepted. Amen? Amen. All right. Nothing like a good little bit of pastoral, you know, challenge every now and then. I'm only saying that because he's not here. So. <laughs> it's it's kind of like, you know, you feel like we all have done this, right? The guys you choose off your dad or you talk tough, but he ain't there, right? <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, I'm going to say this. Do you have any idea just how profoundly privileged we are to have that man, Pastor Roy, leading us? 
And I know that he doesn't want me propping him up like that, but again, he's not here, so too bad. And can I just tell you this morning, I am humbled at the chance to share his pulpit today. And I'm going to do everything I can in hopes of being half as good as that man does in the way he honors God's word and the way he honors your time this morning. So let's get into it. Let's talk about heaven, all right? Again, we're in the latter half of our current sermon series called Headlines. And we have been talking about various major concepts in prophecy like the rapture, the judgment seat of Christ, tribulation, and so on. And today we're talking about heaven. And heaven certainly fits within the prophecy progression, but at the same time, the conversation about heaven is so much bigger than all of that, right? I mean, hardly anybody ever talks about the tribulation outside of an end times prophecy conversation. Hardly anybody ever talks about the rapture outside of end times prophecy. But people talk about heaven outside of end times prophecy all the time, everywhere. I don't hardly know anybody outside the church that ever talks about the tribulation or the rapture, but everybody on the planet somehow, some way talks about heaven. And so because the conversation about heaven is that big, here's my second disclaimer this morning. There is literally no way possible for me to give you a, an all-encompassing, fully comprehensive message on heaven in one shot. It's just not going to happen today. You need to know that. I told just like Pastor Roy the last couple weeks, I also this week had an entire series worth of information for this one message, and more ended up on the floor than ended up in the sermon. I'm sharing all of that with you today because rather than leaving you here, having you leave this morning feeling fed, my hope is that all of this leaves you more hungry when you walk out the door. I am not here to feed you this morning, I am here just to whet your appetite. I think a lot of times we come to church, we treat church like a biblical restaurant. It's a biblical restaurant, hoping for a good meal, right? And as long as we like what the pastor is serving, then we might take some leftovers home by way of sermon notes. But just like those leftovers from those restaurants, they often get lost in the back of the fridge, right? A lot of times our sermon notes get lost in the back of our Bibles. So again, rather than feeling fed by this message, I hope to send you out of here far more hungry than you walked in the door. It is my greatest hope that when, you, when our time together is done this morning, you leave here finding it impossible to be done with this conversation on heaven. I hope that you walk out of here and with a hunger that, that makes you want to go and chew on all of this a whole lot more in your devotion times and in your life group times. I know a lot of you came here today looking for something to eat. But all I'm hoping to do is whet your appetite and ignite your hunger about heaven in the same way that fresh baked bread or fresh baked cookies awakens something in you and makes you want some, makes your mouth water for more. So now heaven. And in our conversation about heaven, I just want to start with a simple question this morning, and that simple question is this. Where does our fascination with heaven come from? Why does every person on the planet Think about it, talk about it, and wonder. Every person on the planet, whether you are a Christian or not, we all have some kind of curiosity of what happens after our time on this earth is over. We all want to know what's going to happen to us when we're gone. And the simplest answer I can give you comes from arguably the wisest man to ever walk the planet, King Solomon. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 11, Solomon writes this. He says, God has planted eternity in the human heart. And so what that means in simplest terms is this, that God has literally put an awareness in all of us. He's put an awareness in all of us that there is something more than just this. God putting eternity in the human heart is one of the fingerprints of God. Some of you are going, I don't know if God is real. I don't know that I believe he exists. Well, do you ever think about what happens after we're gone? Yeah, that's a fingerprint of God letting you know he's real. God has put eternity into the human heart. God has put an awareness in all of us that this life is not, to the, end of the, it's not the end of the story. He's letting us know that there is something more. He's letting us know that there is something better, and, and, and it's out there for all of us. And deep down inside, we all know it, and because we all know it, we crave it. We all know it. We crave it. We want it. But the problem is we don't want to wait for it. We want it all right here, right now. Check this out. Don't we all want, want a nice, comfortable home? Yeah, with a decent yard and nice things? Yeah, and then when we feel like we have it, what do we, how do we describe it? This is my own little slice of heaven. 
You go on vacation to a beautiful location. Some would say where I left in Big Bear, it was a slice of heaven. Let's take this a little deeper, a little bit more realistic now. What are about 90% of all of our prayers about? 90% of all of our prayers, aren't they about taking away our problems? Aren't they about taking away our pain? Aren't they about taking away our sense of suffering and taking away the very same things from the people that we love? Well, we pray for those things not just because they feel bad. We pray for those things because we know that there's something better out there. Revelation chapter 21, verse 4 describes it like this, that there will be both a time and a place where he, God, will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying, nor pain, and all of these things will be gone forever. Isn't that exactly what we're praying for? Isn't that what we're praying for most of the time, 90% of the time? Isn't it this exact thing that we're praying for? Lord Jesus, please take away death. Lord Jesus, Please take away anything and everything that causes us and our loved ones any tears, any sorrow, any crying, and any pain. Friends, we're basically praying for that day in Revelation 21.4 to be this day, right here, right now. When we pray all of those things, 90% of our prayers are simply praying for heaven on earth. But when and where does that day happen? Well, you just back up one verse to Revelation 21, 3, which says, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them. The bottom line is this. That day will not occur until we dwell with God, and he dwells with us, and there will be on that day no longer any death, any sorrow, any crying, or any pain. And when and where is that going to happen? Friends, it only happens when we are in heaven. And so let me tie all that together. Again, Ecclesiastes 3.11, God's made us aware that there's something else better out there, and because we know it, we crave it, we pray for it. But what we're praying for really only happens in heaven. That's Revelation 21, 3 and 4. And so again, without realizing it, 90% of the time we're praying, we're actually praying for heaven right here, right now on earth. And that is why whether you are a Christian or not, we all have such an intense curiosity and have such a longing for heaven in our lives because God made us aware of it. Over the span now of 20 years in ministry, I have officiated somewhere in the ballpark of almost 100 funerals. And the overwhelming majority of them were people who were not Christians, people who were not believers, people who were not really even people of any faith of any kind, not necessarily atheists, just a bunch of everyday folks without much of any kind of faith foundations in their life. Any of you know people like that? Yeah, they're everywhere. There's some of you in here today, some of you watching us online. And even still, just about all of those people, because I knew all of them, along with all of their families, they all, all of them, believed in some concept of heaven. And they all believed that that's where they would be someday. It's like when we die, we just think we're going to automatically be like George and Wheezy, right? The Jeffersons. Well, we're moving on up. <laughs> the deluxe apartment in the sky, right? We're moving on up. And we're finally going to get our piece of the pie. Hey, Roy's got smoke in the bandit. I got the Jefferson. What you going to do? <laughs> I figured I'm from Southern California. Roy's from the South. We just team up and call ourselves Hood and Holler. How about that? <laughs> that was a Pastor Jamie joke, we told you. <laughs> But it just seems like regardless of levels of faith in God, just about everybody has some thoughts, some ideas, some opinions about heaven and hell. And back in 2014, the Pew Research Center, which is one of the world's leading researchers in all things church and ministry around the world, they conducted a nationwide study in the United States that revealed the following information. You see it on the screen. Regardless of religious affiliation or lack thereof, 75% of all Americans believe in heaven, while only 58% of Americans 
believe in hell. Now, one of the first things that immediately catches our attention is the fact that more people believe in heaven than actually believe in hell. Now, that makes total sense to me because when we think of the afterlife, we like to think of good things, not bad things, right? Well, check this out, though. Apparently, that reality doesn't change even within the church either. The study also revealed that nearly 85%, but somehow only 85% of Christians actually believe in heaven compared to 70 who actually believe in hell. There was another uh, study in 2016 by Lifeway Ministries that revealed that 60% of all people believe that heaven is the place that everybody will eventually find themselves after they die. And I share those numbers with you to show us, again, just how all over the map we can be when it comes to heaven, even inside the church. And so because of that, I want to switch gears now and try to bring us some clarity about heaven. And I want to start with one of the biggest realities about heaven, and that's that we go immediately upon our death. First reality of heaven is that we go immediately upon our death. Now, that may seem fairly obvious to a, to a lot of us, but it's not necessarily the case for everybody. In fact, there are a handful of faith perspectives out there that talk about a place called purgatory, right? Now, I've heard two primary explanations for purgatory, and we're going to deal with each of them one at a time. So the first most common er, explanation is that purgatory is a place of punishment where the human soul goes immediately after death to complete the sin-cleansing process before eventually going on to heaven, you got to go for additional sin cleansing before you can get into heaven. Now, here's the first problem with that particular understanding or idea of purgatory. The idea that we need to be further cleansed after death before going to heaven actually diminishes the fullness of the death and resurrection of Jesus. Oh, sure, those, those who argue this perspective of purgatory would certainly agree that the death and resurrection of Jesus makes it possible for us to go to heaven, but they would also say that it only makes it possible you need further cleansing. You see, this particular perspective of purgatory also agree or argues that our own sinfulness also demands our own punishment too. Now, I'm not trying to pick on anybody who supports this, but I am here to say this morning it's not true. It's not true. Purgatory does not exist. And it's not only not found in, in the Bible, the opposite actually is. In Hebrews chapter 10... The Apostle Paul, whom I believe to be among many who believes that, uh, to be the writer of Hebrews, uh, he teaches the first century church that further sacrifices for sin are no longer needed because of what he says in verse 10, Hebrews 10.10. 10. He says, we have been made holy. We have been made holy. We have been made holy. We have been made holy through the sacrifice of the body of Jesus Christ once for all not once and for all one time the sacrifice of Christ for who everybody Paul goes on to say this in Romans chapter 8 verses 1 and 2 he says so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus and because you belong to him not will belong to him someday some further time later but because you belong to him now there's no condemnation for you. And because you belong to him now, and the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you, not will free you, but has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Paul's like, look, you don't need any further cleansing. You don't need it because there's no more condemnation for your sin. Because of the complete work of Jesus and his life-giving spirit now in you, there's no further preparation necessary for heaven other than to have your ticket punched. That's even further reinforced in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, where Paul also says this. He says, yeah, in verse 10, yeah, yeah, you used to be nothing more than a miserable sinner, but now, verse 11, he says, but you were cleansed. You were made holy. You were made right with God by calling on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And if all that's still not enough, Perhaps the best argument against this particular idea of purgatory is Romans 3.25, where again the Apostle Paul says this, for God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life and shed his blood. So the idea that purgatory is a place where we all go for further cleansing from our, from our sins, respectfully but honestly, it's just not true. It's just unnecessary. 
because Jesus took the full payment and the full punishment due to all of us. Then the second, much less common perspective of purgatory is that it's just like a big afterlife waiting room of sorts where we all go to wait for the future return of Jesus. But again, the Apostle Paul kind of shoots that down in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. When he makes it clear that to be absent from the body is to be present from Christ. Paul says, look, when you leave this life, being with Jesus will be instantaneous. You will leave this life standing in his presence. And if Paul's position isn't good enough, I just think we'll take Jesus as the definitive word on this. You remember what Jesus said to the thief on the cross who believed in him? Luke chapter 23, verse 43, right? Jesus told him today, not tomorrow, not someday, when I, when I return, nor after some further purification. No, Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. Again, so, purgatory before heaven? No. We go to heaven immediately upon our death. Now, I'm going to run through the next two or three or three or four uh, really quickly because these are the things most of you already know. And the reality is in the time we have this morning, I want to camp out a little longer on something a little further down the road in the sermon. So let me just say this. In heaven, we will get new bodies. 2 Corinthians 5.1 says, For we know that when this earthly tent we live in is taken down, that is, when we die and leave this earthly body, we will have a house in heaven, an eternal body, made for us by God himself and not by human hands. When the Apostle Paul talks about tents and houses here, he's talking about the body. It says it right here in the passage, okay? And yes, I also have a ton of questions about these new bodies. But not in today's sermon, okay? You're gonna, that's, I'm just going to whet your appetite on that. Go take some time and, and read about it, study about it later this week. Let's keep going. Heaven will also be a place of true joy and happiness. Again, we read it once. We'll read it again. Revelation 21, 4 says that in heaven, God will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death, nor sorrow, no crying, nor pain. All of those things will be gone forever. Those things will be replaced by true joy and happiness. And I'm not talking, you know, uh, uh, kumbaya kind of happiness. I'm talking about, you know, when the scriptures talk about that peace that, that transcends all understanding, the peace of God that just doesn't make sense in heaven, it will make sense. And you will experience a peace and a true joy unlike anything you have ever known. You have never experienced it here on earth. Scriptures tell us that heaven will also be a place of true holiness and purity. Revelation 21, 27. Nothing evil will be allowed to enter, nor anyone who practices shameful idolatry or in dishonesty, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. In heaven, all impurity, all sin, and all things hateful and hurtful will be gone. And instead, we will experience full and true holiness. Oh, and I know. What's this whole Lamb's book of life thing? Not in this sermon, sorry. <laughs> Chew on that later this week. So now you got two things. I got, what's this Lamb's Book of Life? You know, you got, you're starting to create your notes. You're creating your grocery list for your meals later this week in Scripture. Heaven will also be a place of perfect service to God. Revelation 22, 3, no longer will there be a curse upon anything for the throne of God and of the Lamb will be there, and his servants will worship him. Now, I can't tell you how many times I hear people talk about what an amazing party it's going to be in heaven. The incredible, that, that great big barbecue in the sky. It's going to be an amazing party when we're all back together again. But the truth is, like I've already said, we're going to be, we're going to be so captivated with the very presence of God that, that we're not going to be worrying about each other all that much. Instead, we're going to be worshiping and serving God forever. All due respect, I like you. I even love some of you. But you're not who I'm looking for in heaven. Catching up with my family. I love them, but there's a reason I moved out. There's a reason I moved away. I'm not sure they're who I'm going to be looking for in heaven. I'm going to be joy-filled, but I'm going to be worshiping and serving the king. And so will you. Which now leads me to what I think is actually the best and most important thing that I want to share with you uh, about heaven today, and that's this. I think that the best and most important truth about heaven is that we are not going to be the only ones there. That's what excites me. And again, this may sound totally obvious, but more often than not, when most people talk about heaven, all they really ever talk about is having some kind of ethereal family reunion, right? Right? And I have no doubt whatsoever that we are going to see some of our loved ones 
in heaven who have gone on before us. And I look forward to that. But if that's all you ever think about when you think about heaven, can I just say to you respectfully, that is a narrow view. Who all, who all is in heaven? But we do that because that's a human tendency. We like to put ourselves at the center of everything. If heaven's about you, then it will be about your family reunion. You make heaven about you. You make the Bible about you. You make Christianity about you. You make it all about you. But humbly, all due respect, heaven is not about you. Hebrews 12, 11, or excuse me, 12, 1, the Apostle Paul says, he talks about this cloud of witnesses that will gather around and surround those who follow Jesus. Well, he's also, in addition to some of your loved ones who've gone on before you, he's also talking about all of the men and women of faith who have gone on before us. He's talking about the legends of the faith, right? He's talking about Abraham and Moses and David and Joshua, Ruth and Esther. They're there too, and we're gonna see them. And according then to Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 and 2, 1 Kings 22, 19, Hebrews 12, 22, Psalm 103, 19 to 21, Psalm 148 and 2, and a lot of other places, we're also told that there's going to be what the Bible calls heavenly hosts or angelic creatures. Let's dive in a little deeper to Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. It was the year King Uzziah died, and I saw the Lord. And he was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Verse 2, attending him were mighty seraphim each having six wings. With two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet. Now, I've always wondered, why do they cover their feet? I think I know if you've ever preached before. I think they cover their feet because feet are nasty, right? I don't even like feet. Sorry. Two cover their faces, two cover their feet, and with two they flew. They are calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. I love verse 4. Their voices shook the temple to its foundation, and the entire building was filled with smoke. The angels, the seraphim up there, the six-winged seraphim up there for eternity, holy, 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 holy. And there could be some of you up there going, can they just turn that down? It's just too loud. Music's too loud this morning. <laughs> Do they have to keep singing the same song over and over and over? You ever notice that we love you, but there's some grumpy Christians out there? <laughs> we ought to be the happiest people on the planet. So verses 2 through 4, they give us this amazing picture of what some of these angelic creatures, these heavenly hosts, are going to look like. But we need to go back to verse 1 because this is the pinnacle of it all. Verse 1 is the only thing that really matters about heaven. It was the year King Uzziah died. Now here it is. He says that I saw the Lord. He was sitting on a lofty throne and the train of his robe filled the temple. My friends, Oh, my God, you got to get this. you got to get this today. Of all the things that heaven will and will not be, of all the things that will bless us and blow our minds, nothing, and I mean nothing, can even remotely compare to being in the presence of the Lord himself. Side split, nail-pierced hands. That's heaven. To be in his presence. Yes, we will see some of our loved ones. Yes, we will see legends of the faith. Yes, we will see these incredible heavenly hosts. But more importantly, most incredibly, we're going to be in the presence of God himself. That's heaven. Streets of gold. Who cares? There's God. It's all of us walking in there literally going, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. It's all true. There he is. Heaven is his throne room. Heaven 
is his dwelling place. Heaven is his house, so to speak, in which we are nothing more than guests. We'll come back to that in just a few moments, but I've I just got to get this next part out. And it's that as much as we're going to be blown away by who's in heaven, the hard reality is that not everybody's going to be there. The hard, hard truth is that there are two options when our life on this earth is over. One is, of course, heaven, and the other, the other is hell. And hell is a very real place. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here because I think heaven's far more important. But here are just a couple quick references to hell from the Bible. Hell is a place of eternal punishment, Matthew 25, 46. It's a place of eternal torment, Revelation 20, 10. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth, two entirely different emotions, weeping in grief of people who didn't accept the truth sooner. There will be gnashing of teeth. That is, a, that is a, something you do in anger. People angry and bitter for eternity because the truth about Jesus was real. Some will be thrown in the lake of fire, Revelation 20, 15. The whole place will smell like sulfur, Isaiah 30, 33. And hell is the eternal destination of the devil, his demons, and all who rebel against God. Revelation 20, 10, 21, 8. By the way, hell is also discussed in nearly every New Testament book of the Bible, and all of them speak of hell being a place of punishment, destruction, and even worse, banishment from God's presence. So again, I'm not going to talk about hell anymore other than to say God doesn't send people there, but he does let them go there on their own. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, the Apostle Paul writes this. He says, For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my, heart, in my eyes. Paul says, I've told you this before, but it breaks my heart to tell you this again. There are many whose conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ, and they are headed for destruction. I say this with tears in my eyes. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about their life here on earth. Simply put, they are damning themselves by their own actions. What do you mean God doesn't send them there? No, God wants everybody to be with him in heaven. That's 1 Timothy 2, 4. But tragically, people will find themselves in hell because of their own rebellion against God. Okay, I'm done talking about hell. To hell with it. Did the pastor really just say that in church? Well, it fit the context. Come on. Hell's not a place I want to be, and frankly, heaven's more important, so let's get back to talking about that because here's the deal, folks. I'm not, I'm not trying to scare you away from hell today, but I am hopefully trying to inspire you a little bit closer to heaven. Last thing for today. Last thing for today, let me get this plane landed for you. And to do that, let me just circle all, all the way back to where I started with you this morning. I want to circle back to that conversation with those folks, with my church, at my church in California, that were there to shoot that movie. Remember that last question, whether I believed that the way to getting into heaven was to just be a good person? Let me tell you how to get into heaven. Let me tell you what I said to them. You can go to that last slide. By the way, you know that's the prevailing headline of the day, right? The prevailing headline of the day is, if you want to go to heaven, just be a good person. Let me tell you how I answered that question. When she asked me if I believe that to get into heaven, you just need to be a good person, I simply told them this. I said, I would love to believe that. I just can't believe that because it just can't possibly work that way. That way doesn't hold any water. I said, you know, I'm not even going to tell you what the Bible has to say about this because being a good person just doesn't stand up to even a simple logic test. To that, the man who was an elder of the church, he said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, if all you have to do to get into heaven is be a good person, then whose standard of good are we talking about? Whose standard of good are we talking about? Because we all have our own different individual standards of what is and is not good in our lives. 
So let me ask you, is it your standard? Is it my standard? Is it his standard? Is it her standard? Whose standard of good is it? To which he said, well, again, that's not for any of us to say. I said, see, you just proved it. It doesn't hold any water. It doesn't hold any water because the term good is in and of itself a standard. It is a benchmark that we need to shoot for. If you need to be a good person, then I need to know what good looks like so I can strive after it. I said good is an arbitrary standard at best. So I know you can't define good. That's not for us to say, but can you at least give me an example of somebody who might be good enough to get in? Let me make it easier for you. Can you at least give me an example of somebody who's not good enough to get in? Then I added this, said, look, I'm not, I'm not trying to argue, and I'm not, certainly not trying to make anybody look bad. My point is simply this. I said, when you make being a good person the standard for getting into heaven, one, you're putting getting into heaven in your own hands, and that's just reckless, dangerous, and too big of a burden for anybody to carry for themselves. And two, when you try to make being a good person the standard for getting into heaven, all you do is leave people with basically two outcomes, pride and despair. First is pride if people do feel like they're good enough to get into heaven, and then despair if they don't. I said, so look, I'm just not going to spend my lifetime trying to pretend that I am good enough. Instead, I just choose to humbly accept the fact that I'm not. I never will be good enough, nor ever do enough good. But Jesus was and is good enough for me. And Jesus certainly has done enough for me. God, Jesus, intervened in human history and he lived a perfect life and he came and paid the debt that none of us could pay ourselves. And I looked at that group and I said, so based on that, I just choose to joyfully embrace that message of God's incredible gift. God gave us a gift of total freedom through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ. And that guarantees an eternity in heaven. That sacrifice made that possible for me. And after saying all that, I just looked at him and I said, so you tell me, what sounds better to you? What sounds better to you? Living in the turmoil between the pride and the, and the despair of whether or not you're a good enough person to get yourself into heaven? Or simply accepting the fact that you're not? And embracing the truth that that's okay because Jesus was good enough for you? That was my answer. And right now, some of you are going, but pastor, why didn't you quote the Bible to them? Well, because the Bible had no credibility to them. If all I said was, well, Jesus says, well, I don't believe in Jesus. Well, the Bible says, well, I don't believe the Bible. So I just spoke to them in their own terms. But you see all those verses listed up on the screen? They're also in your sermon notes if you're on the app. Take some time this week. Go read every one of those verses. Mark 10, 8, 18, John 14, 6, Romans 3, 23, and all of the rest up there. Go read all of those, and you will hear everything I just said. But I said it in their own terms. Let me end you with, in with this this morning. If you have a set of keys, would you pull them out for a second? Good, pull them out of your pocket, pull them out of your purse. Yeah, please, everybody, pull out your keys. If you've got a set of keys, pull them out. Hold them up high. Let me see them. Everybody got your keys? Hold them up high. Shake them. Shake them. Jingle those skis. Let's, let's hear it. All right. Some of you still playing with them keys. All right, let's just get it out of your system. Come on. Let me ask you. What did you just hear? For most of you, you simply heard the sound of metal jingling against metal. But what you're really hearing is the everyday common sound of sin. Don't you realize that if there was no sin, 
there would be no need for keys? If there was no sin, there would be no need to lock up anything. Nobody would go where they shouldn't go, and they wouldn't take anything that didn't belong to them. Some of you are going, but Pastor Mike, I would never take anything that belongs to me, or doesn't belong to me. And I'm like, I know, because you're a good person, right? <laughs> Those keys in your hand are an everyday reminder that you need, that I need, and that we all need a Savior. Keys are a daily reminder that we will never be good enough nor ever do enough good to earn ourselves a key to heaven. Let me tell you what I imagine my very first day of heaven is going to look like. It's going to start with me standing face to face with Jesus. And I'm not sure I'm even going to be able to lift up my head and look him in the eyes. Because there is absolutely nothing that I will have ever done to even remotely deserve being there. But then I also imagine that Jesus might take my face in his hands, like we do to our children and our grandchildren. I imagine he might take my face in his hands and wipe away my tears and my shame. And I imagine him just simply looking at me and saying, you're not here because of you. You're here because of me and because of how much I love you. And he's gonna say, come on in and enter into the place of my rest. And my friends, there is nothing that I want more today than for you to be able to hear those words too. And so I'm gonna give you a chance to say yes to Jesus today too. I'm gonna ask everybody to bow your heads, close your eyes. There's nothing magic about it. If you're a guest today, we just bow our heads and close our eyes so that we can give each other a sense of privacy. That's all we're doing, giving the people around us some privacy. It would be irresponsible for me to assume that every one of you walked in here today or you're watching online today and that you've already said yes to following Jesus. I'm betting that there are a number of you in this room, a number of you watching online, that you've spent your whole life trying to be a good enough person, trying to do enough good. Maybe you've just been trying to get through life, maybe trying to eventually get yourself into heaven on your own merits. Maybe, maybe you're in here today or you're watching online and you've just got a bunch of doubts You've got a lot of hard questions. You've got some just flat-out disbelief. And if that is you this morning, can I just tell you, you are in a safe place. This church is an incredibly safe place for you to have doubts, to ask hard questions, and to bring your disbelief. And I say that because you are an incredibly good company. We all have and we all do. But if today's the day, you'd like to change all that. If today's the day, you'd like to stop trying to do it under your own strength, trying to be a good enough person. If today's the day, you're simply ready to just surrender, wave the white flag and surrender and say, all right, Jesus, take over. I'm yours. Jesus, be my Lord and Savior. If today's the day that you're ready to declare that, then I'm gonna invite you right where you are just to sit quietly and to pray this prayer after me. Pray it quietly in your own heart. We're not going to point you out or draw any attention to you, but just pray this quietly inside in your own heart and mind. Pray this after me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are who you say you are, and I know that I need you. I need you to forgive my sins. I need you to help me overcome my brokenness. I need you to become my Lord and Savior. Not just for today, not just the rest of my life, but for eternity. And so Jesus, today I give myself to you, I surrender my life to you, and I ask you to come and lead me from this day forward. I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.